Okay, so last week, um, although we had a bit of a sound glitch in the recording, I had to kind of redo redo that lesson and bring us up to up to speed. But um, meantime, where we left off, we had taken a look at what true worship is, what it looks like in heaven, uh, kind of contrast with what we see so often in churches. We, we looked at this in, in Revelation chapter 5, and we're getting into Revelation chapter 5 this evening. Um, as we, we're going to close out chapter 4 first, though. But let's take another look, though, at this Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, tongue, and people, and nation. And hath made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. So looking again at the throne, let's just jump right into this because a lot of this we covered last week. I believe we kind of took a look at uh, verse 5, and we're going to try to motor through as much of this as possible because a lot of it gets kind of repetitious. But I want to look at some other passages because we see... This throne um, echoes of this scene uh, from Isaiah, from Daniel, from Ezekiel. So I think it would be really instructive to take a look at this. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So the lightning and thunder and voices represent the Lamb of God's mighty power and his divine pronouncements that are to be rained down upon an unbelieving world. Thunderings and voices, the, the two oldest manuscripts transpose voices and thunderings. Um, and you can kind of compare that at the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, and that's, that's in Exodus 19, 16. Um, the thunderings express God's threats against the ungodly. There are voices in the thunders. We also see that in Revelation 10.3. That is, not only does he um, threaten generally, but also predicts special judgments. Um, the seven lamps, I don't, we, we discussed it last week a little bit, and I don't think that the, it's a coincidence. We saw the seven lamps, and we reread part of that in Revelation chapter 1. Where there were seven lamps all of, all of a sudden here. Uh, John is called up before the throne, and then uh, we see the seven lamps here, it's just as we saw in, in chapter 1, uh, verses 12 and verse 20. Um, now before the throne. Um, so how and why did they get there, if they represent the church? A thing about figurative language I will say is that a lot of times people who take a, a pre-tribulational, pre-mill position, and a lot of those would be uh, classified as dispensational or dispensationalists, are accused of being too literal and, and, and um, they like to mock um, our position for pre-tribulation and pre-mill for being too literal because they say that, well, how can you say that there's no figurative language in the Bible? Well, um, speaking for myself, I don't say that there is no figurative language in the Bible, because it clearly is, and here's some examples of it here, but where it is figurative, it's clear that it's figurative. You know, you don't need to look at something that you can't explain or that goes against your doctrine or theology and say, well, that kind of goes against what my teaching is, therefore it must be figurative. You know, when you go into Revelation chapter 20, and it talks about the thousand years, the thousand years, the thousand years, and it says it six times, it probably means a thousand years. But it goes against your theology 
and you say, well, I'm all millennial, and I believe the kingdom is right now, so that must be figurative language in chapter 20 because it goes against my theology. It's not an honest way to approach the text. We'll take a look at uh, one particular um, passage about the kingdom in a little bit here in Isaiah that I think will demonstrate clearly that we're, the kingdom is not on earth now, and it can be, but we'll take a look at it. There's a number of reasons, but it's very clear in this particular text. But um, so the seven lamps, you know, the churches in chapters uh, one and two, the churches, um, all of a sudden we have seven lamps before the throne. Um, and then we've got the elders and so forth that, that clearly represent the church because the song that we sing and they're dressed in robes and they've got the crowns. So by implication, the timeline is clearly that it's got to be church and it's got to be church in heaven because it's right before the rest of the chapters because in the very next chapter we're getting ready to get into, chapter 6, after the throne rose, we go into Daniel's 70th week, the tribulation week, and we're not supposed to be on the earth for that. So by implication here, the rapture has happened by this point, right? So now the seven spirits of God. What do you think of that phrase? What does that mean? Thoughts, guesses, insights? Well, the Holy Spirit, something to do with the Holy Spirit. But well, seven. Perfect. Seven is perfect. Seven is a perfect completion. There is a, a, uh, a passage in Isaiah, and we're about to go there, but it does reveal in that passage seven aspects of the Holy Spirit. So the seven spirits of God, um, we might look at as perfect completion, different aspects of the Holy Spirit. That's possible. Anything else? Any other possibilities? I mean, that is correct. That is the you know the way that most theologians will will read that. Um, we'll look real quick at chapter twenty-one. If you want, to, if you want to turn there, for instance, chapter twenty-one. Let's see, verse twenty-three. Notice, uh, we can ver let's start with verse 22. This is New Jerusalem now, different a little bit from the scene we have here. But I saw no temple, and it's speaking of New Jeris Jerusalem. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of all those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth shall bring their glory and honor into it. Does that sound anything at all like some of the lightning, thunderings, the lamps of fire, the throne room, how it's a little bit different? There's that other passages too. You might write down Psalm 119, 105. But there's also the fiery purifier of the ungodly. We have... Um, mentioned in Matthew 3, 11. So those are all key passages that tell us about throne room experiences. But we're going to go into the big ones because um, one is the description of the throne room and what it looks like, and also these um, living creatures that we see around the throne. It's, it's very interesting. So... In Revelation 4, 6, this is an odd description here. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures, full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature was like a calf, and the third living creature 
had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Kind of strange, isn't it? Especially the eyes all around kind of thing. What do you think that might mean? Doesn't John McConaughey say that something? Are they angels because they're praising God? Well, normally I would say, and I used to think that they were angels. They're not really described as angels. They're described as four living creatures. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's a great question. And remember last week we looked at chapter 7, and it described different classifications of who the saints were. And there were some saints there, and there was incense. And the elder came over to John and said, who do you think this is? And, and, the, and John says, basically, you tell me. Well, then these are the saints. And so around the throne we had the classification in chapter 7. We had the throne. And him, he who sits on the throne, and we had all the angels there and the four living creatures. Wow. So they were like classified as different. So the four living creatures, um, I guess they're not really, the scriptures aren't really classifying them as angels. So that's different. So, and folks disagree as to the meanings of this. Um, Virtually any time for something's named in the Bible, um, we tend to take numbers a lot of times and impose the meanings that we found in numbers and impose them on the text when the text doesn't necessarily say it. So we want to be careful about that. But four does tend to be a number of universality, right? We have, we have four Gospels, which paints four different aspects of, of Christ, you know, from four different ways. We have the four winds. Um, four corners of the earth, the Bible talks about. And so all are offered as a way to see these creatures look the way they do. Um, you can contrast these four living creatures with the ones described in Ezekiel. I was going to say, Ezekiel, Whistler says that the eyes are full of power, mm -hmm. and then the... Man is for intelligence, the eagle's for speed, the lion's for strength, and the ox is like a servant. And that's part of the ways that like that goes all throughout the Bible. But there, there is that, and there, and there's also um, different ways that Christ is portrayed. Yeah. Four different ways. So that's kind of interesting. Now, let's let's look at Ezekiel one. Because it's very interesting. It's 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 very similar setting that is revealed to Ezekiel. So I, I take it when we are, are taken up to the Lord and we stand before the throne, we're in for getting our minds blown because this is really fascinating. Uh, now it came to pass in the thirtieth year in the four, Ezekiel one. Oh, okay. Um, Sorry, it's all right. Fourth month of the fifth day of the month, I was among the captives of the by the river Shabar, that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, which was in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzai, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Shabar, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. I hope I pronounced those names right, but I'm sure whoever's name I mispronounced will have to forgive me. Then I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfed, it's engulfing itself, and brightness was all around it and radiating out of the midst of the color of the amber, out of the midst of the fire. Also from within it came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Each one had four faces. Now pause right there. What did it say in Revelation 4? They each had, there are four different living creatures, but they each had their own face, right? So these are four living creatures, but these are different. <clears throat> Maybe Ezekiel is there's a different shift. I don't know. This is the night shift. I don't know what was 
what was going on there. Each one had four faces, and each one had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the soles of calves' feet. They sparkled like the color of burnished bronze. The hands of a man were under their wings on their four sides, and each of the four had faces and wings. Their wings touched one another. The creatures did not turn when they went, but each one went straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man. Each of the four had the face of a lion on the right side. Each of the four had the face of an ox on the left side. And each of the four had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces, their wings stretched upward. Two wings of each one touched one another, and two covered their bodies. Each one went straight forward. They went wherever the spirit wanted to go, and they did not turn when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. So I guess that was glowing, right? Burnished, shining, glowing. Like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went lightning. And the living creatures ran back and forth in appearance like a flash of lightning. So similar in that in that the description of um, you know what types of faces there are represented, but these are definitely different creatures, aren't they? Well, they the creatures represent. God's judgment of some kind, because they're getting ready to, Israel is getting ready to, to you know, Jerusalem, Judah, is getting ready to come under judgment in this, uh, then couldn't they be representing God's judgment as well, coming on what's going to happen in... Right. I mean, these are the kinds of scenes. Yeah, they're just a different, like you said, a different apparition, same creatures, just a different, the judgment here is different than the judgment to come, and how Ezekiel's going to see. And well, I, I think yes and no. I mean, they're very similar, and that there is def, definitely judgment in both cases that are represented, but the creatures are, are different. One has four wings, and the others have six wings. One has a, each has its own face, and then these each have four faces. If they, and I hear what you're saying, but if they are a different... They're angelic beings that can change their shape. Like you've said, different dimensions and whatnot. Could so be that too. God's judgment needed to be revealed to Ezekiel in one way, but in to John in Revelation in another way, but it's the same. There's enough of it that we know if this is God's judgment or mm -hmm. four of them and whatnot that we know, okay, this is God's judgment. Yeah, look, I don't know if it's the same creatures or, or what not, but... I'm asking is, can you say that with authority, that they're not the same, or are we just looking at what they're saying and going off of? Well, by the descriptions, I say they're not the same. Okay. One's, like I said, one has got feet like a calves, the other one's feet like a man. The other one's got, they each have their own face, each one had its own face, one like a lion, one like an ox, one like an eagle. Uh, you know, that kind of a thing. And then these each have four faces. One's, one has, set has uh, six wings, and the other batch of four living creatures has four wings. So they're just, they're different. I don't see, there's nothing written that says that they change, that they can morph or whatever. Um, we don't know it, and it could be too. Again, John's, and Ezekiel might be having the same type of thing where, because they are from another dimension, maybe the appearance and what you're trying to describe, because we're three-dimensional beings, might be be different. But the descriptions are definitely different. So it's four living creatures, and we see slightly different apparitions here. So, so the eyes would represent, they don't miss much. They're not omniscient, because we know only God is omniscient, right? So they watch, they are watchers. Somehow, and they they don't miss they don't miss much at all. They see everything. They um, similarly these also cry, "Holy, holy, holy, Lord God Almighty." So they are 
praising the triune God, right? Um, the triune God is, is recognized, honored, and praised. Um, who was and is and is to come, which is interesting because is to come is a descriptive of of only Jesus, right? Because we're not expecting the Father to come. Where the second coming is Jesus, we're expecting that. So Lord God Almighty, but is to come also describes Jesus as the Almighty. Verse 9, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever. So they give, shall give in one of the oldest manuscripts, um, forever and ever. Or in the Greek, it's uh, unto the age, ages of the age. Now back here, where it's describing these four living creatures, in Revelation 4, verses 6 and 7. Um, it appears that that describes seraphim. And that's what the conclusion most people come to, is that it's the seraphim. Then, in Ezekiel, this is cherubim. So that is the, would be the difference. See, so Ezekiel 1, 4 to 14, again, each creature has the same four faces that we saw individually in Revelation 4. These have four wings, while the ones in Revelation have six wings. So, yeah, some will say the man represents intelligence, the lion represents power, the ox is uh, servile, and the eagle is swift. Some people say that. I don't know. I mean, according to Jameson Fawcett Brown, they said uh, the cherubim here have six wings, like the seraphim in Isaiah 6 2, whereas the cherubim in Ezekiel 1 6 had four wings each. They are called by the same name, living creatures. But whereas in Ezekiel, each living creature has all four faces, here the four belong severally one to each and then you can see that in ezekiel 1 6 again the four living creatures answer by contrast to the four world powers represented by the four beasts the fathers identified them with the four gospels matthew the lion mark the ox luke the man john the eagle these symbols thus viewed express not the personal character of the evangelist, but the manifold aspect of Christ in relation to the world. Four living or four being the, the number significant of worldwide extension presented by them severally. Uh, the lion expressing royalty as Matthew gives prominence to this feature of Christ. The ox, laborious endurance, Christ's prominent characteristic in Mark. Man, Brotherly sympathy with the whole race of man, Christ's prominent feature in Luke. And the eagle, soaring majesty, prominent in John's description of Christ as the divine word. And they go on to say, but here the context best suits the view which regards the four living creatures as representing the redeemed election church and its relation of ministering kings and priests to God and ministers of blessing to the redeemed earth and the nations on it, and the animal creation, in which man stands at the head of all, the lion at the head of the wild beasts, the ox at the head of the tame beasts, the eagle at the head of the birds, and the creatures of the waters. Compare Revelation 5, verses 8 to 10, Thou hast redeemed us by the blood out of every kindred, kindred and hast made us unto God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And also in Revelation 20, verse 4, the partakers with Christ of the first resurrection who conjointly with him reign over the redeemed nations 
that are in the flesh compare as to the happy and willing sub subjugation of lower animal world in Isaiah 11, Isaiah 65, Ezekiel 34, Hosea 2:18. So I'm not sure if I agree with all of that or not, but it's a lot to think about, just something to consider, and I'm throwing it all out there as far as what something like that represents. All we know is we see these creatures, and we see the description of them, and what they represent, you know, who knows. Um, this is interesting, though. The camp of Israel from Numbers 2. Um, every detail by design. What might be hidden behind the details of the camp of Israel? Notice in the camp there are four standards. The Tradition. The tradition says four standards under which Israel encamped in the wilderness. You know, when they set up their tents, so you had the meeting tent and you had the four camps of Israel set up, okay, in the wilderness. You had to the east was Judah, to the north Dan, to the west Ephraim, and to the south Reuben. And, and uh, that's where respectively a lion, an eagle, an ox, and a man in the midst of the tabernacle containing the Shekinah, symbol of divine presence. Thus we have the picture of that blessed period when the earth, having been fitted for being in uh, the kingdom of the Father, the court of heaven will be transferred to the earth, and the tabernacle of God shall be with men, Revelation 21.3. And the whole world will be subject to a never-ending theocracy. And that's according to de Berg and exposition of, in his exposition of uh, Revelation. So the point, the point of union between the, the two views given above is Christ is the perfect realization of, of all the ideals of man. Christ is presented in his fourfold aspect in the Gospels, respectively. The redeemed election church, similarly, when in and through Christ, with whom shall uh, she shall reign, she realizes the ideal of man shall combine in herself human perfections having a fourfold aspect. So when you look at this camp, that's kind of interesting. So we've got here, well, if you can see that okay. So you've got the camp of Reuben, which his banner was a man, and the camp of Ephraim was ox, the camp of Judah was a lion, and the camp of Dan was an eagle. Interesting, isn't it? See how their the camps are laid out? When you go, those numbers on there represent the tribes that were staged under those main banners and their populations and how, the, how big their camps would be. But when it's done, by the time you're done there with the size of the these camps, you have roughly the shape of a cross. Of course, that can all be a coincidence, right? Probably not. But it's interesting, it's the same creatures. So God repeats this. This is an ongoing theme that God's got going on there. It's significant, I think. So, back in Revelation 4, in verse 10, it says, The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You're worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So here we are, we've got the 24 elders recognizing that Christ is the one that's worthy. And worthy, worthy is uh, comes from a root word that does mean worth. So he is the one who has the worth for receiving all the glory, honor, and praise because he's the one who created all things. Again, the crowns we, as we talked about last week, were crowns of victory. Could they not royalty crowns? Immediately, in the Greek, it says they shall fall down, implying that this 
ascription of praise shall be repeated onward into eternity. So that is kind of their aspect. They shall fall down. So we, we fall down and praise God. Um, it's kind of a regular thing we do with, with worship. Although for some reason not really so much in churches these days. Shall cast their crowns, namely in acknowledgement that all the merit of their crowns, not kingly diadems, but the crowns of conquerors, is due to him. It's due to Christ. Glory, honor, and power. Holy, holy, holy. Again, these are kind of aspects of what we see with the Trinity, right? You, in the Greek, it's you um, who did create all things. Where's the passage in Colossians? You guys were just studying Colossians the other day, right? For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Awesome. There's, a, there's another great one. I want you to take a look at, uh, turn real quick to Hebrews 1. It's very similar. It echoes that. About, uh, well, we can start with verse 1. Why not? God has at various times and in various ways spoken time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So it's very similar, right? So all these aspects of Christ and worship and honor and recognition of him is what happens in throwing the crowns down and worshiping and what the angels sing. So again, Colossians 1.16, worthy is the lamb. You also, you know, you can also look at, uh, you know, it's Hebrews 1, but also look at, at John 1, John 1, 3. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So chapter 5, made it out of chapter 4, okay? So chapter 5. And we are going to look at these other, because we're not done looking at the throne room and looking at these four living creatures and so forth, but we're going to jump into chapter 5 here. and We'll go into these other books. So verse 1 says, Then I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. Now, the thing about this, is that there are different ways, and I, and I suppose the scrolls were made. Some books will say, some books, some versions will say uh, was a book. There was a book in his hand. It's a scroll, and this was a book back then. Uh, a codex with pages, you know, like this, we have our Bibles now. This is books in our day and uh, well after this period here, but... For them, a book was a scroll. So this is the scroll that Jesus will open as far as judgment goes in the sealed judgments. Well, what was common was is you had a scroll. This is a small version of it, but, you know, it looked more like this. Some representations people will have will have instead of just one wax seal in the middle of it like this, they'll have all seven seals show up on the outside. That's probably not the case with the sealed judgments in Revelation 6. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, but what was common was he saw writing on, the, on both sides of it. What would happen is, is you would have written on, on the outside of the scroll, the rough side, maybe a description of who was allowed to open it on the inside or some type of instructions. And 
that would be for the person, whoever is the magistrate or whoever was in charge of seeing that the scroll was opened and handled properly. And the seal would be, the seal might also bear the imprint of the person who was allowed to open it. And if you didn't have that seal, you weren't allowed to open it. So then you open the seal, you pop that wax seal, and there'd be more instructions on the inside, the finer details of a contract. And it, it could be a, anything from a marriage contract to like a real estate contract, or any kind of a property or anything like that would be the fine details. Now, sometimes what would happen is what it, it reads like what happens in Revelation chapter 6 is you would open this seal and there would be some instructions on it that it, you'd read on part of it. And then you'd have another seal inside of that. And you'd pop that one open and there'd be further instructions. And you'd just keep unrolling that scroll and each section would be sealed. That reads more like what we read as far as the sequence of events in Revelation 6, other than one scroll with seven seals all along one edge. Otherwise, you'd have to pop all seven of them. And the description we get in Revelation 6 is first seal is open, and then this, and then the second seal, this, and then the third seal, that. So it probably looked a little bit more like this type of an animal here that we see. So in chapter or verse 2 of chapter 5, and I saw a mighty angel. So he's proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? So John says in verse 4, I wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll and to look inside. So it's comes across in the Greek that when John says, I wept, it wasn't just a, oh, a tear. <laughs> it's great sobs. In verse 5, then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He's able to open the scroll and its seven seals. So up to this point in Revelation, from chapters 1 through 3, for the most part, that all the titles for Jesus have been Gentile titles, okay? And But from here forward, it's interesting that, as with the tribulation, all the titles become Jewish for Jesus, right? Because it's the time of Jacob's trouble, and Jacob's name was changed to Israel, right? So it all becomes Jewish, and it's their time. Turn real quick, if you would. I want to say... Genesis 49, Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Gather together and hear you, sons of Jacob. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He he bows down, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who shall rouse, rise him, rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. And you can read the rest of this at, at your leisure another time, but you see the lion of Judah, who's that talking about? So Jesus here is presented as the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? And then the root of David. Who's the root of David? Jesus. Yes. He's triumphed. How did Jesus triumph? On the cross. On the cross and, and, the and the resurrection. Absolutely. Because without the resurrection, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, then we're still in our sins. Um. As we get into Isaiah chapter 11, I want to look there real quick. So that's another key chapter. Okay, um, are you all there? Isaiah 11. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. 
The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and, and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So again, that's all speaking about Christ. Let's, let's keep reading, though, because this passage is very fascinating with what we're reading here. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. What period of time is this talking about here? Class. Okay, let's keep reading. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. Ah, the millennial, millennial kingdom. kingdom. Yes. Okay, now, for all millennialists who think that we live in the kingdom right now, the wolf shall lie down, shall dwell with the lamb. Do we see that now? Yeah, that's kind of... Yeah, that's symbolism. That's, yeah. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play with the cobras, shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord and the waters shall cover the sea. That is not describe the world we're in right now at all, does it? Okay, and then verse 10, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as the banner of the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah, okay, verse 12 in the same chapter. He, sh he will set up a banner for the nation that will uh, assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And also uh, the envy of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah will be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. So there'll be peace and, and all that and, and the Lord's going to gather everybody back together again. So this is the Lord kicking off the kingdom. Verse 11, note that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant. Did you see that in verse 11? It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left. What was the first time? Egypt, right? He gathered them together out of Egypt, except this time, the second time, He's gathering people out from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, and from Hama and the islands of the sea. So he's gathering them all together a second time. So he will, verse 12, he'll set up a banner for the nations and will assemble out all the outcasts of Israel. So what I, I want to point out is that just as the Lord gathered them together out of Egypt, in Egypt, was that figurative? Was that symbolic? Or did he actually pull them out of Egypt physically and actually? So if the Lord pulled Israel out and gathered them together out of Egypt actually and physically the first time, why would it be figured of the second time and symbolic? Just a thought. Just want to point that out because that's something to consider. Folks will tell us that it's all symbolic. And then chapter 5, verse 6, Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. Here we go again. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now here we do have a lot of symbolism, but it's clear it's symbolism, right? So seven horns. The horns represent power. We see that frequently in the scripture. We see that in Revelation, right, concerning the beast coming and, and the horns represent different kings over different kingdoms. So the lamb is, is demonstrated to have power. Um, also, um, honor, uh, the seven eyes, the seven spirits of God, um, and the sevenfold spirit of God. 
Now, now the sevenfold spirit of God, well, you know what, let's, seven eyes, the seven spirit. Flip real quick to Zechariah 3. This, I think this is going to be another key verse to look at and mark down. There are so many. Sometime when you get a chance, I'm sure you have cross-references in your, in your Bible. You should revisit some of these passages and just follow some of the chain references or cross-references in your Bible, what, what have you. Zechariah 3, 8. Um, Hero Joshua the high priest. That yeah, Hero Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon the stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in that day. In that day says the Lord of hosts. Everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. There's that fig tree again. That's why I wanted to look there because fig tree is in there again and it's talking about that day. Remember from a whiteboard here, that day talks about a pretty broad spectrum here of the end times. But that day we come all the way out to second coming and then the establishment of the kingdom, right? So it's talking about in that day and that's the ultimate goal penultimate of everything is leading to that day when he's on his throne. Now, we were in Isaiah 11. Um, in verse 2, we have seven descriptor, descriptors of, of, um, of the spirit found there in that passage, which is fascinating. So we talk about the seven spirits or the sevenfold spirit. You, you might in, for instance, Revelation 5, 6, put down a note, a margin note for Isaiah 11, 2, because it talks about um, the spirit of the Lord, um, Lord of wisdom and understanding of counsel, might, knowledge, the fear of the Lord. So the sevenfold description describes the work of the spirit in the realm of wisdom and knowledge. Uh, the the primary emphasis on all these has to do with cognitives. So there are many attributes of God, right? But all these descriptors here are all cognitive, wisdom and understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, fear of the Lord, all that kind of stuff, which is interesting. Um, significantly, this stands behind much of what Jesus says also in John's Gospel in, in um if you go in and read about the promise of the Holy Spirit that's going to be coming, John 14, 15, and 16 is a big, long discussion about what Jesus is going to be doing with the Holy Spirit. And um, so it's reminiscent of that. So that's a corollary, too. You know, obviously, we're not going to take the time to read John 14, 15, and 16 right here tonight. But in chapter 5, verse 8, he says, And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp. They were holding um, golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, a quick question I would ask you to consider and answer for me if you can. Um, the prayers, they were the prayers of the saints. Any thoughts about what saints these are the prayers of and what's going on here? The prayers of the saints. Now, it could be any of them and all of them, right? I mean, the 24 elders are there. They each have a harp. And they fall down before the Lord. But they're carrying the bowls of incense. So are they the saints that are on the earth at the time? Well, we're going along with the temple worship we make it because the influence yeah. goes into the Holy of Holies. It's a sweet savor under the Lord. So if we're going back into the time of Jacob and whatnot, then that would be relevant. Yeah. Okay, so so we're raptured. And like John, we're before the throne of God. Uh, we're falling before the Lord. We throw our crowns before him. What's going on on the earth at that time? You know, we've all been raptured up, taken out. 
Do you think a lot of people are going to repent at that time? A lot of people will be saved. So there's saints. I hope so. Yeah, I think so. Well, the Bible does say that the a number that no one can count. A number that no one can count, right? So what are they going to be praying? What are their prayers going to be like at that time? Oh, no, I missed the boat. What about those, uh, the, the ten virgins, the five foolish virgins who found that they didn't have oil for their lamps? And they repent, or at least a bunch of them repent. They're going to be praying, right? There's going to be a lot of time praying because they know it's coming. Let's continue. Verse 9. Okay. And they so they sing a new song. And we looked at this before. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. See, it's more than one seal there. And with your blood, you purchased us to God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made us to God, kings and priests, and we will reign on the earth. So we say we will reign on the earth. So we're talking about it, you know, in the kingdom. So here we can see it's the song of the redeemed, right? So this is, it's got to be church. It's got to be the bride of Christ. Verse 11, then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands in ten times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. So here is John, as best he can, clumsily saying, I don't know how many there were, you know. Um, some translations will say myriad, myriads upon myriads and all that. And so millions, in other words, many millions of countless number of angels encircling the throne. And the living creatures and elders, and here it doesn't say how many of the living creatures, but it says and the living creatures. So there's several angels, and here again, we point out that the living creatures aren't numbered with the angels. They're a separate class. So you've got angels, and you've got the, the elders, and you've got the living creatures. Angel is a general term, though, for messenger. And the living creatures, it looks like their primary purpose, their main purpose is to sing praises to the Lord all the time. And angels are messengers. They do the Lord's bidding and run to and fro and, and do as he bids. There, so then verse 12, in a loud voice they said, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, receive power and wealth, wisdom and strength, honor, glory, and praise. Similar to what we saw elsewhere. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise, honor, and glory and power forever and ever. I think it's fascinating how it is that you've got God on the throne. That could be the Father Jesus sits on the right hand of the Father. You have all this glory shining out from the throne. And then suddenly you see one like a lamb slain before the throne. So John is seeing a, a vision here. And then all this, all this praise happens in recognition of, of God and the lamb that was slain. The four living creatures said, Amen. Amen means so be it. Or may it be so, or make it so, make it so. And the elders fell down and worshipped. So that's what worship looks like before the throne. Um, and interesting, so we've got a look tonight at um, worship, what worship looks like before the throne. And seraphim and cherubim. The seraphim and the cherubim are described to look very similar, but very different. And what the meaning is, again, is debatable. Pick one or pick both. They could all be right. Or all three, however many we describe. I think we describe three different meanings of what they can be, and they might all be right. Because, again, we saw that also in the banners of the tribes of Israel. We see that pattern repeated. So God is a God of pattern. He likes to show this to us a lot. So what we're going to look at starting next week is the opening of the actual scroll, what that's going to look like, what that means upon the earth. And that kicks off the uh, tribulation period.
So if you're all ready for that, well, I'm, I'm ready for it because that means I'm ready for it actually physically right now because that means rapture happens before that. So I'm, I'm down with that. Questions? Um, not a question, but um, looking at Isaiah 6, I thought it was interesting that in Isaiah 6, the seraphim were covering their eyes and their feet, or sorry, their faces and their feet. Right. And then the flu was two other wings. Right. And so they, he wouldn't have been able to describe their face uh, like John did here. And then also what they were saying is very similar as well. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Um, again, it, it, how how John describes or what their faces look like, or them covering their faces, and what how that works with the dimension dimensionality type stuff. It's very hard to say. How did John, for instance, in the description of the scroll, know that it was written on both sides? So here, the angels handed a scroll, and the angel took the scroll and said, who's able to open the scroll? Well, the angel still has a hold of the scroll, and John says the scroll is written on both sides. Well, how did John know that the scroll is written on both sides? So the only thing I can think is somehow the Lord disclosed that to him, that that was the case. How did John know what the different faces look like? You know, or that the, the angels who had the eagle on the back of their heads, if they don't change their direction and they don't turn around so we can see, how do you know that there's an eagle on the back side of their head? So what the Lord did and how he revealed that to us, I don't know. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so again, I, I think there are a lot of aspects of this that in detail, we're not just, we don't, it's not disclosed exactly. Uh, how else they know some of the things they do, but that the Lord imparts that knowledge to them. And it's the same type of Holy Spirit intervention that has to happen there that also kept Ezekiel, Isaiah, John, Isaiah before the throne. And he's, you know, falls down. I'm a man of unclean li in clean lips. And he's the same type of a thing. Um, he just feels, I'm not worthy to be here. You know, and the angel came and, with tongs and took a coal and touched him to his lips and says, you're now pure. Um, he felt woefully inadequate, which is different from what we're getting from a lot of the more charismatic type groups right now that say, yeah, I went and had this vision with Jesus and we went and walked in the park today. And, or the guy who tried to say that, I forget his name, who it was, that said it, but he said he had a vision of the Lord when he was in his bathroom shaving and there's Jesus next to him. Hi. Buddy, that kind of no. You're gonna fall before the. You're gonna feel um, the holiness of God over. Yeah, over. Well, you're gonna fall down on your face. You're not gonna be high, buddy. Um, no, no. Those are all false, and those are people trying to impress their friends and their church members and whoever else with, look how spiritual I am. God came and talked to me. I had this vision of heaven, and I walked around, I had this dream, and I was walking around with Jesus in the park up there in heaven. I don't think so, because it never describes this type of a setting at all. Yeah, it was all a big garden, and there was beautiful trees and flowers everywhere. Where's that in any of these descriptions in Isaiah, in Ezekiel, and in Daniel, and Revelation? Yeah, yes. Now, we might see that in the New Jerusalem eventually, because it describes streets of gold. There's no temple in it, that kind of stuff. It's all different from what we have, descriptions before the throne. So something else I want to think, want you to think about over the next few weeks, too, when we think about going to heaven like this and being before the throne of God is um, how long are we actually in heaven? When I was a kid growing up, you die, you go to heaven, and you're up there in heaven forever and ever. Are we up there in heaven forever and ever? Think about that. Also, what about this notion of, oh, you know, my my poor whoever died well before their time. He or she is now an angel in heaven. <laughs> Where does it say we turn into angels? There are descriptions in the scripture about us, you know, having wings as eagles and that kind of thing. You know, but everything with wings, with wings is an, an angel. I know that's, there's that kind of stuff to think about, too. So we get a lot of bad information. So it's, it's good to look through the scriptures and parse these out and try to figure out what is accurate and what isn't. It's interesting to see cherubim and seraphim are different. 
six wings versus four wings, each their own face but different creatures, and others with four faces on their head. Uh, it's very strange. It's going to be bizarre. It'll be interesting to see. Um, eyes all around. What's all, you know, that's going to be, I don't know what that's going to look like. Eyes in the front and the back and on the inside. and wing, Eyes on the insides of their wings and all this kind of stuff we see like in Isaiah. Interesting, fascinating. I don't know what these guys were seeing, but I guess we'll find out eventually, right? Any more comments or questions? It's a good comment, by the way, about the wings and how this is just going to be a Holy Spirit disclosure kind of a thing. So, all right, let's close the prayer real quick and we can continue to discuss and think about. But think about that again, how long we're in heaven. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for this group of, of um, students of your word, Lord. It's such a blessing and, and great questions, great insights. And this is mind-blowing, Lord, and it's, it's kind of hard to comprehend exactly what these guys were seeing. But, but uh, Lord, I'm up for the challenge. You can bring us up there. Even now, uh, Lord, rapture us. And, uh, or as we've kind of half-joked about saying, too, like in the wedding tradition, Father, send your son to take your bride. We're, we're ready. This earth is so profane and evil and wicked. And Lord, we just want to be in your presence forever. We know that that is forever, is being in your presence. And we, we um, would so enjoy that, Lord, and, and all the folks who've gone on before that we all miss. Lord, we're looking forward to this, this great reunion of uh, all the saints, all before your throne, singing, holy, holy, holy. You alone are worthy, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen.